Cotters are taking the weekend off, and uh, the Marks family is in Arkansas. Uh, we hope. I haven't heard from them. I thought I might give them a call this morning, but I'll, I'll either interrupt church or a nap. They got there yesterday? Okay. Uh, our text this morning is going to be from uh, Exodus chapter 4, and we're going to begin with verse 1 and go through the first five verses. So if Rick can line us up with Exodus chapter 5, or 4, chap verses 1 through 5. In chapter 3, Moses has been giving a series of excuses to God as to why he wouldn't be the ideal individual to lead God's people out of Egyptian slavery. And, you know, I used to have some pull in Egypt, but now I'm a nobody. I'm back out here in the wilderness. I work for my father-in-law. Can you get any worse than that? Uh, I'm a shepherd, and it's just not an impressive resume for a leader now. Besides, they put me on the most wanted list back in Egypt, and I don't know if I want to go back there or not. And besides, I... I stumble around when I try to talk, and I'm just not a good speaker. Well, the excuses continue into chapter 4. Moses answered, well, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Who do you think you are, fella? I mean, you're showing up here to, to lead us out of Egypt. Don't you realize the Pharaoh is powerful and you're not? Uh, where have you been the last 40 years? Uh, well, okay, with your father-in-law out in the wilderness herding sheep. Uh, very unimpressive. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And that's the title of our lesson today. What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. I mean, I'm a shepherd after all. You know, it's got a hook on the end. You can grab a, a sheep and pull it back in. You can poke one and prod it along. Uh, you may even use it if a predator shows up. Uh, and it comes in handy as a walking stick. You know, it's just the tool of the trait. It's what I have. It's just an ordinary uh, staff. That's all it is. And then the Lord said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake. And naturally, he ran from it. We like to run sometimes from what we cause, do we not? So, you know, okay, uh, that didn't turn out quite as well as I thought it might, and I'm, I'm getting out of here. Um, and then the Lord makes an unusual request. The Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And Moses, who probably has seen snakes before, especially if they're cobras, know that you don't take a snake by the tail. If you're going to pick up a snake in the first place, you want to get close to the business end where he can bite you. Don't take him by the tail where he can recoil and get you. So Moses recoils himself from that whole idea and takes off. Well, Moses eventually reaches out. He takes hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. Amazing. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. You want to know? You want to, you, you're objecting that who, they're not going to believe me. Who said... The Lord appeared to you. The Lord said something to you. Uh, take your staff. And Moses takes that staff, which from this point on usually is called the staff of God or the rod of God. It's now not just your ordinary thing, but if you cast it down, if you put it in front of me, I can change it into something that will be quite different and quite useful and quite amazing. And so we see Moses with that staff as he goes into Egypt. And uh, he strikes the, the Nile River, which is, like most rivers, made up of water, and it turns into blood. That staff, that ordinary 
tool of the trade has now become something dramatic in the land of Egypt. And he continues to use that staff and other plagues happen. God is using the ordinary tool of his trade to do extraordinary things so that he will receive glory. He takes that staff and he holds it over the Red Sea as Israel is leaving and the waters part and they stay parted until all two million or so of the Israelites can go through there at night and then later he takes that same staff and the waters close in on the Egyptians as they try to follow the Israelites across the Red Sea. Moses has that staff again in chapter 17 of Exodus where they're fighting the Amalekites. God says, take that staff with you and go up on the hill and hold it out, hold it up. And he gets tired and when the staff and his hands are up, they're winning the battle. But when he gets weary, the Amalekites start to win. And so there are others who come and they help him. They hold up his hands. That's where we get that expression. We, we can hold up somebody's hands and support them in their ministry. And the Amalekites are eventually routed here. He takes that same staff and the Lord says to the complaining Israelite problem. He says, strike that rock. And he strikes the rock and water comes out there at Mount Horeb, the holy mountain. You say, I thought he was supposed to talk to the rock. That was the second time. The first time, strike the rock. And he struck it and the water came out. The staff was continually used throughout the life of Moses. This thing that he had in his hand. An ordinary thing that God said is now going to be used for extraordinary things. Look at other examples in uh, the scriptures where you come to this young man whose name is Samson. He has long hair. Uh, he seems to me like he's the, the epitome of the juvenile delinquent of the Old Testament. And uh, God says to him, what's that you've got in your hand? And he says, well, it's, it's a jawbone of a donkey. Okay. I want you to, to use that jawbone and uh, I want you to go out against the Philistines and he takes an ordinary jawbone from an ordinary donkey and slays a thousand Philistines with that. Now you try that without God's help and see how far that gets you. Uh, then we come to David and we say, David, what's that you've got in your hand? And he says, well, it's just a sling. It comes in handy out here shepherding sheep. And uh, I've got five little smooth stones to go with it, like we sang this morning. And God says, okay, I want you to take that sling that you've got in your hand and those five smooth stones, and I want to introduce you to Goliath. And you'll know what to do when the time comes. And so he does, and he uses only one of the five stones. And he slings it around and around. One little stone goes through the air and the giant comes tumbling down. You wonder why he had five smooth stones. He only needed one. Someone said, well, Goliath probably had four brothers. So, you know, just in case anyone else stepped forward to argue the case against God's people here. David, what else is that that you've got in your hand? Oh, it's, it's a harp. Uh, you know, things kind of get lonesome out there when you're poking around with the sheep. And he says, I want you to take that harp and I want you to use your imagination and I want you to combine some words with it and I want you to write some hymns that will live on in history, some psalms. And so he does, taking an ordinary thing, an everyday thing, and turning it into something that lasts forever. We go to a little bit later in time and uh, God sees this widow who is in desperation. She has enough flour uh, and water to make a last meal for herself and her only son and then we're, we're out of here. We're going to have to die because it's a famine. And that preacher by the name of Elijah shows up and he says, what's that you've got in your hand? Well, it's just a little flour, a little meal. 
and uh, we got enough for one more meal. And the preacher says, well, I want you to make me something. You know, preachers are kind of that way. Let me eat first. And she's probably thinking, well, you know, there's not going to be anything left after the preacher eats. So, uh, okay, we'll give it a shot. And uh, she makes a meal for him, and lo and behold, there are some leftovers. And she and her son eat that, and then the next day, well, there's still some more meal, and she makes the preacher a meal again, and then, well, there's enough for her and her son. And that goes on for a long, long time. What's that that you've got in your hand? Not much. But the Lord multiplied it and turned it into a lot. We come to the man Gideon. He's in hiding. And the Lord says, greetings, mighty warrior. And he comes out of hiding and he says, I want you to take something in your hand. Now this may seem like it's ordinary. And we ask Gideon, what did the Lord put in your hands? He says, well, some lamps and pitchers and trumpets. Well, what does he want you to do with that odd assortment of things? He wants me to go to war against the Midianites. Okay. That doesn't sound like you're battle ready to me, but if the Lord is behind it, then maybe he can use that unusual battle array for his purposes. And Gideon takes 300 men. He planned for a lot more than that, but the Lord said, nah, we've got to pare this down. And uh, they won a mighty battle with those unusual instruments of war. Come to the New Testament. And Jesus is out in the wilderness with thousands of people. We know there are 5,000 men, probably triple that number when you add the women and children. And uh, it's lunchtime and nobody seems to have brought lunch except this kid. Uh, Jesus says, I want you to go out and Take inventory among the people. See if you can find anything. I want you to feed the people. Okay. Uh, what are we going to do? They go out and they, well, we found one uh, lunchbox. Uh, five loaves of bread and uh, a couple of fish. Now, these loaves of bread are not like you buy in the grocery store. You know, it's not even that much. They're little biscuit type things. And so the Lord takes that ordinary lunch of a little boy and he multiplies it. I think that's a great prayer. Lord, would you take the little effort that we have, the little thing that we offer to you, and multiply it. Uh, we have no ability on our own with this ordinary small offering to do much. But if you will take it, you can multiply the benefit of it. Then we come to a woman by the name of Mary at Bethany. Mary, what is that you've got in your hand? Well, it's a box. It's pretty important. I've been saving it for a special occasion. Uh, and it's quite expensive. And, well, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to sell it and get the money and feed a lot of poor people? Well, no. Actually, I'm going to pour it out. And I'm going to anoint Jesus. And they say, well, you know, that's not real smart. Uh, you could have added to your 401k if you'd have spent that thing wisely. Okay. Well, she pours it out. And Jesus says she's done more than she realized. Because wherever the gospel is preached, this story will be told about her. And how she has anointed me for my burial, whether she realized it or not. We're not going to have time to do the proper anointing for burial, which was considered a big thing in Jewish circles. But she's done what she could with what she had, and it was an extraordinary thing, even though you thought it was very wasteful. Then we come to the temple, and it's got this impressive uh, aura to it. And there's this widow who kind of just sort of slips in there, along with some other people who look much more impressive and they're nicely dressed and they got on their Sunday or Saturday best in this case. And uh, there's this widow that just kind of slips in and slips out. And Jesus said, did you notice the widow? She made the biggest contribution to the temple offering. Well, I wouldn't have guessed that. I didn't think she had that much. Well, all she had was two cents. But, you know... She's given more 
than those other offerings. We're not talking about a math formula here. We're talking about ultimate good. And you know, I think that woman has probably inspired more people to put in their two cents worth than all of those wealthy people who put in more mathematically than she did. Um, she did something that no one else could with their offerings. And she took what she had, it was all she had, and she offered it to the Lord. Move on to the book of Acts, and we see a woman by the name of Tabitha. Her Greek name is Dorcas, and the fact that they use her Greek name may indicate that she had some influence in the, in, you know, in the Greek uh, area. Uh, she may have been a, 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 a Greek convert to uh, this Jewish, new Jewish religion called Christianity. And we say Dorcas or Tabitha, which means gazelle. What is that you have in your hand? Oh, it's just a needle and a thread. And we're told that with that needle and thread, she made a lot of stuff for the poor. And she made a lot of good connections, a lot of good relationships with the widows. And then she died unexpectedly. And there was great mourning. She had been such an influential individual in the church there. Uh, and at, at Joppa, and she had uh, had this ability not only to make clothing, but to weave together relationships through what she was weaving with her hands. And there was this great morning. They sent for the apostle Peter after she was dead, put in an upper room. And what were they hoping? I don't know. That he might see that she had a proper burial or maybe even that he might be able to do something no one else could. He goes into the room, sends everybody out, and he says those words, Tabitha, get up. And she does. I'm not sure about what this was a preparation for Simon Peter. Here she had had a great influence in this church in Joppa, and Peter is in Joppa when he gets a revelation from God about what is common or what is unclean. And here this woman who has this Grecian name has introduced him to a wider area, to a wider range of what the Christian community is. The early church was determined to stay there in Jerusalem and they were staying very Jewish. But now here's this woman who maybe has a Greek background and he's introduced gently into that and then when there's another vision that he has and it's about food, food and preachers seem to go together and he's hungry, rise, kill and eat, not so. I'm very religious, I'm very Jewish. I don't eat anything that's common or unclean. Two men show up, three men actually, show up and they say, there's someone who wants to see you. He's out here uh, in this other area. His name is Cornelius, he's a soldier. He's a good man, he gives to the poor. Will you come with us? And God says, go with them. And, you know, just with his diplomacy, he comes to the front door and he says, I'm not supposed to be here. You know, Jews don't go into Gentile houses, but hey, I've been nudged into this. Uh, what am I doing here? And Cornelius says, we're here gathered, all of us, to hear what you have to say to us about a word from the Lord. And he goes on with his sermon. And one of the things that he mentions is that this Jesus that we're following is someone who went about doing good. Very similar to that language that was used of Dorcas. She had given all of her time and effort with that needle and thread to making things and to doing good. And as he's in the middle of his sermon and he's about to close it out, God takes action. The Holy Spirit falls on them. They, they begin to speak in other languages. And he says, well, that beat me to the invitation song. Uh, since God has done this and he's poured out his spirit like he poured out his spirit on the apostles on Pentecost, can anyone object if we put some water into the mix? and have them baptized. Well, can't see any reason. God's 
baptize them with the Spirit. Why not put some water in there, uh, even as we've been baptized in the water and Spirit? And so God is taking here some ordinary things and doing extraordinary things with them. Starting with Moses, going all through Scripture. God, I think, enjoys the glory of the ordinary. We think, I'm not that qualified, I'm not that special, I can't do that much. But God asks you and me, what is that that you've got in your hand? Okay? He might say, Melly, what is that that you've got in your hand? And uh, she apparently is out there with the kids right now, and she might say, well, I've got some, some tents, and I've got some china, and I've got some tea, in case we want to have tea and crumpets, or maybe tea and croquet. Uh, I've got a truckload of other stuff. Uh, we're going to have a special Easter feet, F-E-T-E, -E, uh, which is a special occasion, a festival, like they had in medieval times. And uh, we say, well, for someone who has had an issue with feet problems, why are you trying to do this Easter feet? Well, it's what I've got, and I want to put it down before the Lord. And guess what happened last Sunday? If you missed last Sunday, I mean, today, either, <laughs> you know, I think they're all tired from last Sunday. But we had 50 plus visitors last Sunday. And we were approaching 130 in our attendance. What might happen if we take some ordinary tents and china and tea and croquet or whatever for whatever occasion and we make it a special occasion? What might God do with that? Now some of those folks who showed up were part of the family. What might happen if they get more invitations. What might happen if we involve them in Bible studies in our homes and they become a part of this fellowship? By our small, ordinary efforts, God might decide to multiply that into to greater good. We might uh, listen in as the Lord looks down at Will and he says, Will, what is that you've got in your hand? And he says, well, it's a pole, just a pole. Well, what kind of pole is it? It's a maypole. What are you doing with a maypole here in April? Aren't you a scholarship winner? Uh, <laughs> are you trying to say you're ahead of your time? Or why would you have a maypole in April? And by the way, you noticed in the bulletin that uh, there's an article that appeared in the Foothill Sun Gazette. Nice article, it's posted, uh, about Will's uh, Jack Kent Cook scholarship. And Richard told me this morning, there's another one, in case you haven't seen this one, in the Valley Voice. So, uh, here the Lord speaks to Will, and he totes in this maypole, and tents, and whatever else. Uh, there was a ton of stuff that was there, and we see uh, the good that came out of that. And then the Lord looks at Imogene, or also known as Emma Lou, by some. <laughs> Those of you who don't know the joke behind that, the, one of the people, the best memories that I've ever met was Lenny Sitton. But the one person she couldn't remember her name was Imogene. She called her Emma Lou, I'm a Jean. <laughs> Irma Lou, you know, just she was all over the ballpark. I and I enjoyed that so much that I've kept Emma Lou. And so whenever I call her and I say Emma Lou, she knows who it is. That just cuts through the <laughs> who is this that's calling. And the Lord said, "What that you got in your hand?" And she says, "Well, it's a box. It, it just an ordinary box, yeah." But we've got an extraordinary verse that's written on the box. It says, pray that the message of the Lord may be spread rapidly and be honored. From 2 Thessalonians. It's an ordinary box. But we put donations for Bibles in here. And we've sent Bibles to the Ukraine, to the public schools. 
they still allow Bibles in public schools in the Ukraine? Uh, we don't. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little too volatile. Uh, but it's gone there. It's gone out to the disaster relief uh, among churches of Christ that operates out of Nashville. So those Bibles have gone to different places in this country. They put Bibles in every care package that they send to people who've been hurt by floods or other natural disasters. That little thing, what has it done? Don't know. What's that you got in your other hand, Emma Lou? Or I'm a Jane, whatever your name is. Well, it's power for today. Actually, it's 25 of them that I subscribe to. And uh, we give them out to different individuals. In fact, uh, you know, we give them out to different ones, but some of the same every month, or not every month, but every three months. Uh, there was uh, uh, an individual here in the manor house who was getting one of these, and the family saw that, and they came by the office, they'd been here a couple of times, and said, can we get some extras of those for our kids and our family? And I say, sure, we got some extras. And so God taking a little thing and multiplying it and getting good stuff out there. We might say to Becky, if she were here, what is that you've got in your hands? And she would say, well, it's a class two driver's license. Well, good. That can be used. Not just for your old occupation of bus driving, but it can be used with the Manor House Church van to drive to special occasions. The Lord says, Marcia, what is that you've got in your hands? And Marcia might say, well, it's just a mailing list. I've got a mailing list of... Uh, uh, our people, and if they're not here for church or alumni who've moved to the Bible Belt or wherever, uh, we send church bulletins to them, and the word gets passed around. Uh, Corey, if you're awake, what is that you've got in your hand? Well, it's a camera, and uh, I'm not sure if that was his idea or Rick's idea, but yours truly if you want to recount this and go through it again, if you're not wise if you do that probably, but uh, you can go on YouTube and you can watch what happens here on a regular basis. Uh, Rick, what is that in your hand, our tech deacon here? And he says, well, it's a website or it's the Facebook site that we have for the church. And so we can go there and I put in current news, I put in quotes that people respond to. Uh, Candace and Cliff, what is that you've got? Well, it's just a room. It's an ordinary room. Well, it's a little larger than most rooms, but it is a nice, large, ordinary room. And the Lord says, well, if you'll put it in front of me, what do you say we have a teenage Bible study in your house on Thursday nights? And we'll get 10 to 15 teenagers to come to that. And we'll get a 20-year-old out of uh, Springville to come down and help you, and he'll teach the class. And so they agree to that. And now on Thursday nights, they have this teenage Bible study. Uh, it's used for a Bible study. It's also used for a food fight. I've heard that. Uh, and you say, well, a food fight doesn't sound very spiritual to me. No, but it's very teenage. Uh, and so there's a mixture here of the spiritual Bible study and the other stuff. Uh, you, you don't have one probably without the other. Uh, Ruby, if you can hear me back there in Arkansas, uh, what is that that you have at your disposal? And I use that term judiciously because I want to move from the hand here to the garbage disposal in the kitchen. She has at her disposal the, the kitchen. What do you use the kitchen for? Well, various things, but we want to use it in May, coming up in May, for a wedding shower. Wedding shower? Yes, for Rachel and Scott, who just got married. Well, aren't they moving to North Fork? Yes, they're moving to North Fork. But let me, in, let, me let you in on something here. 
there's been a dramatic change in their life, their life together. And they've made a, a commitment to the Lord uh, to do some good things. I, I can't tell you the difference that I've seen uh, in their lives. And we want to honor them sometime in May with a wedding shower. Is that going to benefit us? Maybe not. But it's going to benefit them. And God, who, who knows what God will do with that small effort, that small thing. And what might be the repercussions of that. To those who are shut-ins, to those who are sometimes limited, maybe bedfast. Uh, what is that that you've got in your hands? Well, not much. All I've got is time on my hands. Good. If you've got time on your hands, would you remember to pray for me? Would you remember to pray for the church? Because that is some of the most valuable work that can be done. And it can be done regardless of your position. And so they do. They pray. And we see the results of some of those prayers. Those who've been absent are back with us this morning. We see Tony and Willie who are improving from their problems. Ernestine, a uh, marvelous story there, coming back to the manor house we trust this week. Um, Tina, Tina Sewell, what's that in your hand? Well, it's just a church bulletin. Oh. And, you know, you got to overlook the editor who does this, and it's just kind of an ordinary bulletin. It's nothing special. What are you going to do with that? Well, I'm going to throw it down before the Lord, and I'm going to give it to my brother for encouragement so that he can use it with his Bible studies in incarceration. Don't overlook the ordinary. Don't underestimate it. God enjoys taking the ordinary and turning it into the extraordinary because then he gets the credit and not us. Because who would have thought that a staff could do all of the stuff that it did? Who would have thought that our meager efforts could have the repercussions that they have? George, what is that in your hand? And George might say, experience. A lot of it bad experience, some of it good experience, but out of that experience that the Lord has brought me safely through, I feel like now I can have an encouraging word to offer others who are traveling the same path where I traveled. And we've seen beneficial effects from that. In one respect, uh, what goes on there reminds me of Saul of Tarsus. Saul, what's that in your hand? And he says, it's a thorn. And I wish I could uh, get loose from it. It's a th actually a thorn embedded in my side, and I've been trying to get it out of there. But God said, no, I want it to stay there, and I want to do some things with that thorn. We don't bond with each other generally because of our marvelous successes. We bond with each other because of our pain. You find people that share pain, and the bond is almost instantaneous. I remember when my wife was having surgery in Fresno, you start talking with some of the folks that are there. And uh, I asked this guy, I said, what is your uh, spouse in for? And he said, she's in for gallbladder. Uh, what is your wife in for? Well, she's having uh, some surgery on her neck and uh, some stuff that Dr. Arian is going to do. And he said, Dr. Arian, he says, look at this. He said, he did it on me. He's number one. Uh, there was this immediate bonding. And he left earlier than I did. And, you know, as he leaves, you know, goodbye. What is it about our difficulties that unites us? Don't ever overlook the opportunity that God brings through thorns and difficulties. Um, we are individuals who are bonded, 
by our pain. Let's close with these passages from 1 Peter and then Romans chapter 12. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and be sober so that you may pray. Wake up. We're coming to the end of all things. And God is up to some good things. Be sober so, so that we can pray. That's the chief work of God is prayer. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I don't have much. I've got a house. Okay, be hospitable. Use what God has given to you. And don't crump, grumble about it in the process. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't all have the same things within our reach. But we have to be faithful stewards in using whatever God has put there. It may not look like that much to us, but in the hands of God, it becomes a mighty staff for good. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul adds to this a great collection of gifts. Each of you, each of us uh, are part of one body. We have many members. And these members do not all have the same function. Aren't you glad that we're not all the same? So in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We belong to each other. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. He mentioned earlier, by the grace given to me as an apostle. And then he lays down a commandment. Not all of us can lay down commandments, but that was his gift of grace to be an apostle who could offer scripture and commands. By the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. A lot of faith, prophesy much. Little faith, prophesy a little less. But in accordance with the measure of your faith. If it's serving, then serve. Well, I'm a servant. Get to it. If it's teaching, then teach. Don't sit on the gift. It is, if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. Don't give tightwadly. If it is giving, be generous. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Acts of mercy, doing things that extend mercy to others, always be cheerful in whatever situation you find yourself. What is that in your hand, church? And then more specifically, what is that in your hand, individually. It's time for us to take inventory. Time for us to look at ourselves. What has God put within our reach, our grasp? What does he want us to offer back to him so that he can use it in a glorious multiplied sort of way? If you want to respond to his message this morning, would you do so while we stand and sing?